This video is on complex numbers, and this is the first of a series of videos on this topic. And I'm going to explain this from the ground up, starting with the very basic ideas of what complex numbers are and why we need them, and then go on to explain how we can use them to solve problems that we otherwise wouldn't be able to solve. This is aimed at an Algebra 2 level of difficulty, so if you're in an Algebra 2 class and you need some help with complex numbers, this, this video should be helpful, or if you're in a more advanced class and need to review this concept or clarify some ideas in your own mind about this concept, this video should be helpful. Let me start by saying that complex numbers, despite the name, really aren't all that complicated. You just need to understand the basic idea, and I'm going to explain this from the beginning, and I'll start with an example that shows where, uh, where complex numbers come in handy, or not just handy, but are in fact necessary. 2x squared plus 9 equals 5. Take a look at this problem. This is an ordinary algebra problem, so let's try to tackle it using the basic techniques of algebra, which basically says we can do pretty much anything we want to do to the equation as long as we do exactly the same thing to each side, so it stays balanced. Now my goal here is to solve for x. I want to isolate x, I want to manipulate this equation so it eventually says x equals something, so clearly I need to subtract 9 from each side and the plus 9 and negative 9 cancel out. That leaves me 2x squared on the left. And on the right, I have 5 minus 4, which is negative 4. And then I divide by 2 on each side. And the 2's cancel, and I'm left with x squared equals negative 2. And then to solve for x, to get x completely isolated, I need to take the square root of both sides. So on the left, the square root of x squared is just x, and on the right, when I take the square root of negative 2, I end up with plus or minus, don't forget the plus or minus, plus or minus the square root of negative 2. Now at this point, you might think, ah, that's the problem. We can't have negative numbers under the radical. And in Algebra 1 classes, we typically get to a situation like this, and we say that there's no real solution. And the terminology here is meaningful. When we say there's no real solution, we mean there's no real number that is a solution to this equation. There's no real number that we can plug in, like think, think of this, no real number that we can plug in right there for x and end up with negative 2 as a result. It turns out there's no real number solution, but there is a complex number solution. And when you think of real numbers, just think of the number line. So if you imagine 0 here and we put our little tick marks, but the numbers don't have to be right on the tick marks, remember. You could have the number 2, or the number negative 1.5, or the number pi. Any number on the number line is a real number. And that's why we call it the real number line. And that's basically the definition of a real number, is any number that exists on the real number line. And there's no number on here that solves this equation. Because when you get to this right here, you realize nothing squared is ever going to give me a negative number. If you take any number, positive or negative, and you square it, the result is positive. So when you get to something like this, something squared is a negative number, which is the same thing as ending up with a negative number under your radical sign. You end up with no real number solution. So again, that means there is no number on the number line that solves this equation. However, there are numbers that are off the number line. Literally, they don't sit on the number line. So like instead of the number 2 right here, there might be a number up here, or over here, or down, down here. There are numbers that literally aren't on the number line. And because they're not on the real number line, they're not real numbers. But these are called imaginary or complex numbers. Imaginary numbers or complex numbers. And I'll explain in a little bit the difference in those two terms. But these are numbers that aren't real numbers, which just mean that they're not on the real number line. Now, to deal with numbers that aren't on the real number line, mathematicians define this. Mathematicians say i is equal to the square root of negative 1. Or you could say this, i squared is equal to negative 1. Either way, the, these two statements right here are mathematically equivalent. You define this new number, call it i, and the i there stands for imaginary. So it's not a real number, we call it an imaginary number, and it is defined to be the square root of negative 1. 
So you can see that if you were to take this equation and square both sides, this would become I squared, and then the squaring of the right side would get rid of the radical sign, and we'd be left with negative 1. So defining it like this, I equals the square root of negative 1, or like this, I squared is negative 1, either is the same. Some, either way, either of those are equivalent. Some textbooks use this definition, and some use this definition, and either one is okay. Just remember that. Remember that I is the square root of negative 1, by definition. And it's not a real number. Now, unfortunately, the term imaginary uh, isn't quite accurate. It's not just a figment of someone's imagination. It is an actual number. It actually exists. It's just not a real number, which means it's not on the real number line. If you draw the real number line, say here's 0, and then numbers going to the right and negative numbers going to the left, the number i sits up here above the 0, just one unit up above the 0. It's off the real number line, literally, so it's not a real number. But it really does exist. It is a number. We can't call it a real number because the real numbers are defined as the, one, the ones on the number line. But it is an actual number. So now let's see, what does this mean? What does it mean for i to be the square root of negative 1? Well, defining i like this allows us to solve problems like this. Let's take a look at this problem again. 2x squared plus 9 equals 5. And if we subtract 9 from each side, once again, remember we had 2x squared is negative 4, and we divided both sides by 2, and we got x squared is negative 2, and then we take the square root of each side and we get x is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative 2. Now when I get a negative sign under my radical, I can deal with that if I just remember this fact. i is equal to the square root of negative 1. So I'm going to think of this 2 here as negative 1 times 2. And then the square root of negative 1, this part right here, the square root of negative 1, that's simply i. So I'll go ahead and show the intermediate step here. This would be plus or minus the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 2. And then you can see that that is equal to plus or minus i times the square root of 2, and that would commonly be written like this, plus or minus the square root of 2i. It's common to put the i at the end. The i there is not underneath the radical. We took the square root of negative 1 times 2 and broke it up into two pieces, and the square root of negative 1 simply becomes the i. And then the square root of 2, we'll just leave that as the square root of 2. We could approximate it as a decimal if we want to. And I wrote this down here in a different color just because you typically do that step mentally in your head. Typically when you see the square root of a negative number under the radical, the negative 1 pops out and just becomes an i. This is very similar to simplification of radicals that you've seen before. For example, if you have the square root of 12, what you try to do is find factors of 12 that are perfect squares. So this could be written as the square root of 4 times 3. And 4, remember, is a perfect square. So the square root of the 4 just comes out of the, the 4 comes out from under the radical and gets square rooted. The square root of 4 is 2. So this ends up being equal to 2 times the square root of 3. So just like we can find a perfect square factor and bring it out from under the radical, if we have a negative number in, inside a radical, like suppose we had the square root of negative 5, well I can think of this as the square root of negative 1 times 5. And just as my, my 4 got square rooted and became a 2, the negative 1 here, when it gets square rooted, it becomes an i. So this is equal to i times the square root of 5. And again, we typically put the i at the end, so square root of 5, i. So just remember that one fact. Remember that the square root of negative 1 is equal to i by definition. And then you can handle negative square roots. And there's lots of other things that we can do with i, as we'll soon see. But that's the main idea. i is the square root of negative 1. And knowing that allows us to deal with negative numbers under the radical sign.